Brain circuits are hyperactive. Neurons process sensorial information continuously, which, without interruptions, reach the brain from the outside as well as from the body itself. The outside world communicates with the brain thanks to sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste, the senses or sensorial mechanisms of the body. Not all of them, however, are equally important. Whales, sperm whales, and dolphins are considered animals of great intelligence. They learn fast and have a very elaborate language for communication. But the most striking aspect of the functionality of their brain is that they use their ears as their main source of information. Cetaceans continually emit sounds that bounce off everything in their path. The sound of these impacts is processed in the brain, which is how they determine, with precision, the size and distance of objects. They become oriented and they navigate and capture prey through this biological sonar, especially when they are swimming in dark or cloudy waters. We humans, on the other hand, perceive reality mostly through vision. What we see with our eyes is more convincing than what we smell through our nose or touch with our hands. If there is a conflict between the information sent by our other sensorial systems and what we see with our eyes, the brain will trust what our eyes see. For this man, however, Perfect vision does not guarantee that he will capture the most elemental reality without any problems. This is the clinically described case of a musician incapable of interpreting the data transmitted by his eyes. His doctor showed him a rose, and he described it as a 15 centimeter long object, a red circular form with a green line added on. When he smelled it, however, the sensations became pure recognition. Oh. It's a rose. This case, described by the famous neurobiologist Oliver Sacks, shows how damage to the brain prevents visual information from being correctly processed, something that does not happen when the data comes from other senses. In reality, we do not use our eyes to see, but rather our brain. The organ for seeing is a mere camera that collects luminous information, information made up of thousands of colors and contrasts that the brain transforms into objects, people, and sensations. The brain interprets the information and directs the attention to certain aspects of the image, like a table, a knife, and a child. Then, the brain describes what it is seeing. It interprets it and compares it with the database in its memory and finally provokes a reaction. Careful, the child might take the knife and hurt himself. Starting in the 19th century, the observation and study of syndromes and strange diseases due to brain damage were a major incentive in the development of brain sciences. It was a time when the location of the mind was highly debated, and those who defended that the mind was found in the brain were supported by solid evidence related to syndromes and rare ailments. For the first time, it was possible to establish some correlations between specific parts of the brain and certain mental functions. The French doctor Paul Broca was one of the pioneers in the discovery of locating some functions of the brain. After several autopsies performed on patients who had suffered deterioration in speech, 
he was able to determine a relationship between oral expression and the third convolution of the frontal left lobe. Later investigation has confirmed that the ability of verbal expression is located in this area. The work by Broca and his contemporaries marked a path of research for neurosciences, which are still used even today. They consist in dividing the brain into parts in order to define which mental functions are related to each section. Well, two techniques commonly used are um, correlating the location of the lesion with changes in behavior. You know, when a small part of the brain is damaged, you, you get not an across-the-board reduction in all your abilities, but often a highly selective loss. And that gives you confidence in asserting that that part of the brain is involved in that function. Another technique is to do functional brain imaging, where different parts of the brain light up when you engage in different tasks, and you can actually image these parts of the brain. And by combining these two techniques, we can now learn a great deal about localization of brain function. And I think a better word is specialization rather than localization, that some part of the brain is specialized for mediating a particular function. There are many striking examples. One is the fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobe. The cortex is formed by two symmetrical halves separated by a deep longitudinal groove. Their functions are different. The left hemisphere generates logical, verbal, and analytical thought, while the right hemisphere is the more subjective side, controlling emotions and creativity. If the left side is more mathematical and rational, the right side is more poetical and imaginative. Each of the hemispheres is divided into four lobes. The frontal lobe is related to cognition and intelligence. The parietal lobe is for sensory input. The occipital lobe processes visual information. And the temporal lobe is the auditory receptive area. Research into the different mental functions has drawn up many maps of the brain. Perhaps one of the most complete maps is the Penfield Motor Homunculus, developed about 50 years ago by the neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield. After carrying out brain surgery with local anesthesia, this doctor was able to observe how the stimulation of specific zones of the exterior cortex was associated with the external sensitivity of different parts of the body. This image, in human form, reproduces the correlation that he established between the different parts of the brain and of the body in accordance with the sense of touch. The hands and mouth are highlighted due to their size. For the brain, they are the best receptors of information obtained through physical contact. Locating these functions, however, has its limits. Many mental activities do not present a clear location, and mental activity is often subdivided and distributed to different parts of the brain. In the case of mathematical calculations or recognizing a face, many zones of the brain are used, not just one, in order to activate these actions. We learn more and more that the brain executes many functions in parallel, functions that are related to each other but occur in different places in the brain and are bound together uh, in a dynamic way um, rather than being bound together in a hierarchical structure. There are two ways to bind um, items together that are distributed to begin with. You have signals coming through the ear, signals coming through the eye, signals coming through the senses and they need to be made concordant in some place. And uh, the classical notion is that this is done through convergence in a pyramidal shaped uh, processing architecture and that you have on the tip of this processing pyramid um, the coherent representation. Now it appears as if the brain were not organized that way. It's organized in a more distributed way. Things do not eventually come together. They stay parallel, they stay distributed. In the right prefrontal cortex, neuroscientists have located a unique ability of human consciousness. 
This is empathy, a human being's capacity for experiencing the feelings and thoughts of another. He not only realizes who he is and how he feels, but also forgets about himself for a second in order to experience how the other person feels and understand her motives, her state of mind, and her feelings.